right now. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Chanel Hasten. I am the Director of um, Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. And so I will just give you a little quick lightning info about the Alaka Alliance and who we are before we hand it off to Brent. So our mission uh, is to restore a healthy population of sea otters on the Oregon coast and in the process also help make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. So our name Alaka is actually from the Chinook trading jargon uh, word for sea otter. And as you can see, sea otters have a long legacy here in Oregon and a really strong cultural heritage connection to Oregon coastal tribes. So here are some of the other words from different tribes for sea otter. Uh, we know from a lot of archaeological digs that sea otters were utilized for a variety of purposes. And you can see here are some bones um, and they were a super common item in these sites. So due to the legacy of fur trading from Russians and Euro-Americans, British and others, they wiped out the sea otter population on the West Coast um, pretty badly. So uh, there have been translocation efforts in Washington in the Puget Sound and recovery in Southeast Alaska and in the Aleutian Islands. And there's been population growth in the small Central California population, but there's still an 800 mile gap from Northern California along the Oregon coast and through much of Southern and Central Washington. Which means that a key predator is no longer there. Um, and so uh, sea otters are really important in the marine intertidal zone and eat urchins and lots of other kelp herbivores and also crabs, which uh, are beneficial for eelgrass and estuaries. And there's also another predator in the marine ecosystem, which is the sunflower sea star. So they do similar uh, role as sea otters in terms of eating lots of sea urchins and kind of controlling that population. So having diverse predators in the kelp forest is really, really important. But unfortunately, in 2013, 2014, there was a sea star wasting disease, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, uh, where there was a unprecedented collapse of the population. And, um, and now they're noted to be critically endangered by the International Union of Conservation of Nature. Um, and so this is thought to be related to ocean warming trends. So in 2014, you can see here that there was a huge ocean blob with big dramatic increase of high water temperature extremes, which is um, most likely connected to the sea star collapse. So now we're in an ecosystem with no sunflower sea stars and no sea otters and sea urchins are just having a heyday, not being eaten by anybody for the most part. So here's an example here in Oregon, in Port Orford in 2016 and 2018. You can see in 2016, the bull kelp forest was thriving. And in 2018, with the urchins just repopulating and eating everything in sight, they pretty much demolished a lot of our kelp forest here on the Oregon coast. So sea otters are very important. So when they're present in the marine ecosystem, they help keep the sea urchin population under control, kelp forests can flourish, and uh, diversity and biological productivity are super duper high. So we definitely want them back here in Oregon. Kelp is also really important because they sequester carbon in the atmosphere. So they provide a great ecological service towards climate change. So you can look at sea otters as a mechanism for climate resilience, in addition to their awesome ecological benefits, benefits to fisheries and improving kelp ecosystems on the whole. 
So we recognize that we're reestablishing a really important cultural connection that tribes are very interested in. So we support this alongside their ecological and economic value towards reintroduction. So our strategic ob objectives, we are currently um, on our first draft of a feasibility study uh, towards yada restoration. So what are the pros and cons of reintroducing them? Is it a good thing? Is it not a good thing? Um, and hopefully reach a consensus on restoration. Therefore, hopefully in the near future, we can proceed to restoring them here on the Oregon coast. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, check out alakaalliance.org. We have a plethora of um, information about kelp forests, indigenous coastal tribes, and um, sea otter science. And also, you know, social media plugs for all our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And so now we're going to pass it on to Brent Duran. He's an avid scuba diver, surfer, writer, photographer, and marketing legend living in Northern California. He's been diving for 25 years and shooting underwater for 10. And we're really happy to have him here to give us a more in-depth view of the kelp forest ecosystem and some um, cool, you know, notes and tricks for um, photographing all the things underwater. So let me stop sharing and have you switch over. Cool. Thanks, Chanel. Um, yeah, thank you for, for having me here. Um, always happy to, uh, to come share photos and talk about the kelp forest and photography and, um, you know, answer questions about all those things. So there we go. I think my screen should be shared now. Um, but yeah, you know, hopefully we can cover some some fun info um, here um, here on shooting in the kelp forest and answer some questions. So you know, if you guys do have questions, maybe put them in the chat, and then we can come back and we can answer some of those at the end. We'll definitely leave room. So if it's about the kelp forest or photography or gear techniques, whatever that might be, I'm happy to to answer some of those questions. So. In terms of what we'll cover, a little background, and then we'll go through some gear, and then some of the things I look at in terms of um, dive conditions and dive sites, gear, navigation, and you know, basically putting all those things together for a successful dive, um, and then share some photos just from up and down the coast, um, you know, this this great west coast um, of the kelp forest, um, you know, touch into the changing ecosystem, and of course, we always want to finish strong and on a positive note with some of the beauty of our kelp forests. So, you know, a little bit about me. Um, so basically I started scuba diving in 1997. Um, got a nice organized timeline here, but um, started getting into underwater photography about 2011. Um, basically what happened is I was uh, doing a lot of night diving at the time for the last few years, um, you know, after work driving up um, into Malibu to do some night diving there. And I would shoot landscape photos, um, seascapes, landscapes and things from up in the mountains to the beach pack all the camera gear away, put on my dive gear and then hop in the water. Um, and then finally realized, hey, I should start shooting photos underwater. So slowly started um, you know, building together a camera system off of eBay and started trading some marketing consulting for camera gear. And um, one step led to the another. And um, pretty soon I was working in the dive industry and um, I've been teaching photography and writing about photography and um, camera reviews and things like that since about 2013. Um, so I was living in Los Angeles there. These days I now live in Northern California. So most of my diving is actually up here in Sonoma County, Mendocino County and uh, world famous Monterey. So we've got a, a good variety of, of terrain and great diving and also difference in kelp forests too, where we've got the, the bull kelp forests up here. Um, uh, in Southern California, it's mostly all macrocystis. So it's nice to have the, just this blend from SoCal and Central Cal into Northern California, and even some of the further North uh, species, which is cool. And I'll have some photos coming later. Um, you know, in terms of uh, my goals with photography, I guess it's really just to spark the feelings of wilderness. And I think if you um, empower people to have those feelings, remind them of those feelings, hopefully people can find a cause that they can attach to and hopefully, um, you know, change their life or change their patterns just towards um, towards more conservation. So I think, you know, tonight is a good example with Alaka Alliance and there's just so much great work we can do and, you know, great organization really working to make change. So, you know, I think that, you know, means a lot. 
So in terms of underwater photography, there's, there's two different types of photography. So the macro, which is the really small stuff here. And then of course the wide angle. So the big reef scapes, divers, big marine life, shipwrecks, all that type of stuff would fall in the wide angle category. So we'll talk about both of those today, um, starting with the gear. So basically the underwater camera gear um, or underwater photography, I should say, is a very um, equipment intensive and expensive hobby. So the, um, you know, you've got your camera and then you'll get a housing um, to hold the camera that allows full functionality to all the camera controls. Then you'll add in different lighting depending on what you're doing. Um, so the systems can grow and get pretty big like you'll see with this diver on the left um, or with my camera rig here on the right but it doesn't have to be like that. Um, you can have a much more simple, small, easier to carry and pack system like this Sea uh, Life, actually the Micro 3.0, that will shoot great cameras as well. Um, I'm a big advocate while having um, really nice DSLR camera gear that photography will really, um, or you can produce really good photos with any camera. It can be your mobile phone in a housing. It can be an entry level camera, an action camera, or you know, a really expensive, sophisticated system. You know, just some of the basics and understanding of composition and natural lighting and things like that. You're really going to get the best photos with your gear, um, and can get great photos with an inexpensive system, or even better than some folks with a really expensive system. So it's really how you how you create this mentality of looking at some of the images. Um, and looking at your dive and the, the marine life you're seeing throughout the dive and throughout these kelp forests um, that will really make the difference in your photography. And hopefully some of that will come through as I start sharing more images. So like I mentioned with the housing, we've got full access to all the camera controls inside of these housings. So we can really change all the settings as if we, as we would on land, just underwater. And of course there's different settings groups and different settings mentality for shooting underwater. Um, one, just because it's darker down there, we're shooting through water oftentimes in low visibility, but then two, we're also working with uh, a lighting system. So we'll have constant video lights that are always on like a flashlight or underwater strobes that have a pop of flash, sort of like a, a studio light. If you have a model in a studio, you're going to flash. And um, that's gonna help us produce great color and freeze some of the motion underwater and really help create some of the vivid images we see you know, on Facebook and Instagram and the magazines. Um, this is kind of the setup for the wide angle type photography where you have your housing for the camera itself. And then you, depending on the lens you're using, you will have a port extension. And then you'll oftentimes have a very big dome port at the end of the system. There are smaller dome ports, but this big, um, this big dome port system is pretty standard for, for shooting uh, wide angle photos. Um, there's different types of lenses you can use within those. Um, and that comes down to specific camera and, and specific shooting preferences. Um, you know, always happy to talk about that stuff in detail, um, maybe in the Q&A, if it's specific lenses. Um, but the big thing to keep in mind here is you've got a very expensive camera in a very expensive housing system, and it's all held together by O-rings that need to be kept immaculately clean. One grain of sand, one eyelash, one cat hair, one any piece of a, of a lint from a towel could break that watertight seal and then cause the whole system to flood. So you need to be very meticulous with this gear um, and looking at the O-rings. Like this example here is covered with sand after a beach dive just from all the particulate in the water just settling down on the camera throughout the dive. Um, so you need to make sure everything's immaculately clean, spotlessly clean. So you know, it's, it's something that takes a lot of time and attention to set up for your dive and then also to tear down and break down from your dive after you've been out shooting. On the macro side for the small subjects, we'll use a, a standard macro lens, which has a different type port. You'll see it's a lot smaller here. Um, and then oftentimes we'll use a diopter on the end of the, the lens port. And basically that's just a big magnifying glass that allows you to magnify the image on the camera sensor. So you can bring out more detail in some of these small subjects. Some of these shrimp and some of these nudibranchs and things are you know this big. They're a half a centimeter to a grain of rice in size. So to, to really see those and, you know, avoid cropping um, on your computer and really capture that image as large as possible, we'll combine the macro lens with the diopter to get up really close and capture that great detail and that depth and that color and contrast. Um, one of the other tools that's really popular with macro photography, macro photography these days, if I can say that right, is um, using a snoot at the end of the strobe. So the strobe creates a flash and what the snoot does is you can see in this picture here it creates a very tiny little beam of light 
that will basically be the size of an eraser head to the size of, you know, something about this big around. Um, like a tennis ball. So depending on, on what filter you use with the snoot or how far away the snoot is from the subject, you can really shoot some amazing macro subjects, even in low visibility conditions, like in Northern California or Oregon or in the Puget Sound a lot of times. Um, you know, you could have one meter visibility, you know, three feet, four feet, and you can still produce macro images in that kind of um, shooting situation by shooting super macro with the snoot. So really useful tool if that's your jam and you're doing a lot of photography in um, low vis conditions. That said, snoots are extremely popular these days um, with all underwater photographers because they give you these nice clean backgrounds. So you can sort of see here, we've got this, this circular pattern right here where the light fell and everything around it um, wasn't touched by the light. So there's no particulate, there's none of that organic matter or any of that sand that's naturally in the water column. All that is eliminated for the most part because we're using such a narrow beam of light. So it's a big trend that's researched the last five, six years in underwater photography and still popular, but I think it's a great tool for, for the type of diving we have, um, we have up here. So in terms of diving and carrying this heavy camera system, um, especially for the type of diving that we do here um, with shore entries and climbing up and down rocks and cliffs and beaches and sand and entries and exits, and there might be surf, um, I like to attach the camera to my BCD. So I'll use different types of clips and have a couple of different YouTube videos on how to actually build this system and clip off your camera to your BCD. But the point being, I try and keep the whole system very tight and organized and streamlined on my chest so that I have two free hands for holding onto rocks, for putting on my fins, for doing whatever I need to do when I'm on the shoreline and when I'm getting into the water, especially if it's a little rough. You want to be one, two, two swift movements to get both your fins on and kicking to make sure you're past the surf zone. So by having the camera completely attached outside of what you need to worry about, you know, it's just one less thing and you can focus on the important task at hand, which is, um, you know, getting in the water and getting situated. Um, and then I'll keep the camera on my BCD while I descend, um, especially important in low visibility. You're worried about your dive, getting your gear situated, settling into your dive, checking your gauges before you start fussing with your camera. So by having it clipped off, you don't have anything in your hands. Again, you're free to hold a flashlight, look at your gauges, look at your computer, whatever you're going to do, um, hands freeze, you know, really a, a good best practice um, in, in the type of dive conditions that we do have. Um, and this is a fun shot. I just threw it in here. Um, my buddy, we were on a kayak dive and suspended our camera rigs underneath the kayaks just during the surface interval versus having them bake in the sun. We got back in the water and this little rockfish had taken shelter. Um, must have come over from the kelp. You can see a little kelp behind him. Um, so it must have swam up and decided this was a nice, safe place to, to hang out. And we had trouble getting the rockfish out of there, back onto the reef. You just wanted to stay there. So um, you never know what you're going to see. All right, so in terms of forecasting dive conditions, um, you know, this type of diving up here is so much different from um, vacation type diving where you could go to, you know, most likely a tropical destination on a resort or a liveaboard and you can knock out 36 dives in seven days, back to back four or five dives a day. And it's, it's nice, it's, it's fairly predictable in terms of conditions. The guides really know what they're doing and can guide you on a nice safe dive. Up here, things are different. We are very much, um, Need to be self-sufficient so i start looking at conditions um you know as far out as i can um just to try and find those times off of work when when the conditions will line up to to go dive well and then i start figuring out where i want to dive so you know the conditions have to be safe um, and even with uh, an educated guess on the conditions. Um, visibility is, is somewhat unpredictable up north, whereas in Southern California, visibility can be pretty easily predicted. Maybe not easily, but you have a good gauge on it based on what conditions are doing. I found in Northern California, it's anyone's guess. Um, so that's always going to be a challenge and you should always prepare for that. One of the things I do going to the beach now is I'll bring a plan B and a plan C. Maybe plan B is to bring a wetsuit in addition to my dry suit and I'll just hop around in tide pools or near shore and try and shoot sea and enemy split shots or something like that, or even just change it up and take the stand up paddle board out. So because the conditions vary so much and you never know, I'll try and try and um, plan for that and account for that. 
But some of the factors I'm looking at, and this is actually a screenshot from Surfline on the right. There are a number of different websites out there that can help you predict surf and wind. Um, Windy is a great app um, geared towards sailing, but really nice for, for seeing you know, wind and how that will affect near shore waters in terms of um, short period swell that could hit different sites um, depending. Um, but I like Surfline. Um, it shows you the swell size, the period, the direction, the wind, um, as well as tide information too, because at, at certain sites, the tide will make a difference. Your visibility will go from 20 feet down to 10 feet just with uh, 30 minutes of tide swing. So that's really important to, to look at and phase into um, when I'm planning dives and trying to pick a dive site. So choosing the dive site, there's a few things to look for. Um, certainly we know the popular dive sites by name, but once you get out there and start exploring and trying to find new dive sites, um, you know, one of the things about uh, diving up here is that while the dive sites have certainly been dived before by people who are brave to do long surface swims um, or by boats who are, who are diving, you know, around the edges of the, these secluded bays and things, um, it still feels like you're exploring and diving for the first time. So I find that really alluring. So some of the things to look for in those types of situations are, you know, what does the, what do the coastal features look like? In this photo right here, we can see these big cliffs and drop-offs with um, some sea stacks and um, wash rocks leading out into the water. So we can guarantee out there that we're going to have um, most likely some depth. And then we're also going to have a lot of great vertical structure, um, slopes, pinnacles, and all of that. And once you have that kind of structure, you're going to have great habitat for marine life. So you're going to have crevices and cracks that will have water funneled through, um, especially when there's big surf out. And we know that a lot of invertebrates and, and different marine life like that love those high water flow areas. So it's a good spot to start looking for, for marine life like that. You know, it's very exposed to winter swell and and gets that water flowing through it. Um, and then it's also fun to have that big structure around. So I'll look for these types of, of areas to try and find dives and plan dives. And you'll also start looking, um, you know, different last few years, but you can start to see where kelp beds are. And those can be shallow. Um, if there's no structure around where you see kelp, you can basically gauge, it's gonna be a diveable, um, you know, a diveable area because it's not gonna be too deep, right? The kelp is growing there. And then it might drop off around that. Um, if it's not a shallow kelp bed, it might drop in a deeper structure. And all that presents really fun dive opportunities and dive sites to explore. And when you do have some of those pinnacles, it can help with navigation as you can try to go around them or go around a structure of pinnacles on a point and end up at, at you know, point B, wherever you decided your, your exit point was um, when you were playing the dive. So, you know, just some of the things to, to look for in, in scouting some sites like this. All right, so in terms of navigation, these are a few of the tips that, that I use. Um, of course, a compass. One of the things about diving up here is that a lot of the structure looks the same, especially in lower visibility where you've got three meters, about 10 feet visibility, and you, there's rocks and rocks and boulders and rocks and sloping rocks and walls and the walls curve and the rocks curve. It starts all looking the same. Um, so it, it can get pretty challenging pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, compass is certainly something. I keep a, con uh, a compass on my SPG console so that I can always reference a compass and I can do that in hand with my dive computer if I'm looking at a compass while kicking during a safety stop. So I'm constantly using the compass, it's invaluable. Um, and then landmarks, if visibility is good enough or if you know the dive site well enough, you can start to see landmarks to navigate, know where you are. Um, another thing with visibility, or if you're shallow enough, you can start to see the angle of the sun. So if you're kicking out and the sun is on your left, you know exactly what side the sun should be on on your way back on the right side. So those types of things will help too. And you can kind of do a radius, you know, based on, you know, 45 degree angles where the sun is to help you navigate through, through the reef or pinball type structure where you have to constantly swim around rocks and pinnacles and stuff like that. So keep an eye on the sun, look up, figure out where that is and keep an eye on it. Uh, the direction of the surge and swell, something um, a lot of us have probably experienced. You can tell it's coming in and going out. So just get a feel for that um, when, you, when you descend, and then that can help guide you um, uh, on your dive out and then back to where you want to end the dive. And then sand ridges too. So sand ridges often run um, parallel with the shoreline. Not always, but most of the time, um, depending on the site. So you can look for those, and those are an easy way if you drop into sand to kind of get a gauge on which way's out, which way's in, or, or as you're navigating around structure, you can start to see which way's out, which way's in. 
Um, and then triangulation from the surface. So if you're on a kayak or a, a paddleboard or something and you're diving and want to hit a site and maybe there was kelp last year, but there's no kelp this year. If you knew where it was from the surface, maybe when you go to these sites, you start triangulating, you can look at some of the, the tree to the house. And then on this side, you've got the mountaintop to the tree to that one end of the fence. And you figure out exactly where that dive site is. So you can drop down um, without any other references. Um, for example, if the kelp is gone, or even if there is some kelp um, at low tide, but then you know all of a sudden the kelp is, is underwater at high tide or, or something like that, or wash rocks too, that will disappear on a high, high tide. Okay, so dive gear, um, the temperatures range from mid 40s to mid 50s. So generally seven mil wetsuits with a five or seven mil hooded vest is the way to go. Booties, gloves for sure. And you know that's fantastic for, for learning for one dive um, or even multiple dives if you're quick or if you're swimming around. Um, a lot of people um, who, are, who are actively swimming, exploring a lot or hunting, you know, wetsuit is, is plenty warm even when it's as cold as cold gets for up here. Um, that said, for photography, I gravitate towards my dry suit. Um, usually my dives start at 90 to 100 minutes, and then we'll get down to 90 or 80, and then the last one maybe about 60 minutes. So try and spend a lot of time in the water and minimal movement with photography. You want to try and keep that buoyancy still and just gentle frog kicks so you make sure to see the subjects as you're moving through. So a dry suit just really helps for spending all day in the water, um, you know, shooting, shooting photos when the heart beats really low. Um, streamlining, streamlining your gear is essential in the kelp forest. You don't want anything dangling or getting hung up or catching onto the kelp. Um, that's always best practice for anywhere you're diving, even on a tropical coral reef. Don't want your gauge, you know, raking across the reef or across the corals. Um, and then self-sufficiency is, is key, you know, making sure you're prepared for that dive, you know, the plan. And even if your dive buddy's right next to you, you can be pretty self-efficient and your dive buddy can step in if something happens. So, you know, in these rougher, wilder conditions, being as self-sufficient as possible really, really helps. Okay, so now the fun stuff here with the kelp forest. So I'll share some photos and, you know, like before, put those questions in the chat, or save the questions and we can get to get to those soon. Um, so macrocystis, um, generally, you know, this uh, was a lot of my diving um, in Malibu and Palos Verdes, San Diego, the Channel Islands and Catalina, all the way up to um, like Monastery Beach or the breakwater in Monterey. So, you know, fantastic diving, spectacular diving. This is one of those kelp forests where on a great clear day, the sun twinkles down through the, uh, through the undulating kelp leaves and creates this cathedral-like experience of just twinkling light rays and it's just spectacular. It's like walking through a, a redwood forest or any other, you know, rainforest or old growth forest. Just it's three-dimensional. It's way different from diving any coral reef or um, you know, just diving on big rock structure. It's just the life is happening around you to the sides and above. So really, really special place um, for those who, who have not done a lot of this kelp diving. You can see here that the kelp, um, the macrocystis grows really quickly, really tall. Um, you know, it's just spectacular. I believe it can grow up to two feet a day in optimal conditions, which is a lot of growth for algae. So really, really fun. And one of the unique things, again, is that you don't have to dive on the bottom, you know, just over the sand or the reef. You can hover and dive mid-water column and have great experience. Look for crabs and, and fish in the kelp forest. You know, all of these species that are making their home in the kelp forests, um, you know, it's a bit of a nursery. It's protection from larger predators and things like that. Just another shot. I love these descents when you have nice clear days. Um, here's my dive buddy just dropping in. Um, this is off Catalina Island off the West End. So um, a spectacular kelp forest when we were there last um, and ready to shoot some photos. And this is actually from that same day here, um, trying to get a, a sense of movement. So one of the things with the kelp that we'll notice with photography is the kelp is moving in the surge. And to help portray that, you can slow down your shutter speed to help create that sense of movement. So um, it can get complicated, but long story short, basically, when you have a slow shutter speed, the, the image is going to blur during the time that the shutter's open. So the kelp is going to sway a little bit. And then when your strobes flash and pop, they're going to freeze all the motion. So you have this combination of blurred movement of the kelp with the frozen kelp from the strobes. And that's what creates this little bit of sense of movement. Um, and you can calibrate it to exactly the right amount of movement that you want. Um, we've even got a little senorita here, you know, swimming, doing its business. 
So again, a uh, female sheep's head right here, um, sheep head fish just hanging out in this kelp forest. Um, you know, one of the, the things that was going on the last few years um, in Catalina, it's a little better now, but um, the sargassum um, growing in with the kelp. So it's been something that um, a lot of people have been doing a lot of great work with and keeping an eye on. It's an invasive species. So there's, um, you know, there's always something to look at and, and keep an eye on, you know, in the kelp forests and, um, you know, try and have different mentalities with it. You know, is it something to include in photos or not include in photos or to document scientifically or, you know, there's lots of different mentalities within just the photography community on that. So, you know, for everyone shooting photos, there's just different ways to approach it and include it, exclude it or whatever you want to do there. Um, looking up, we've got some senoritas, some blacksmith. Um, so just a lot of lot of fun fish, um, you know. And the the kelp forest is great, whether it's calm or whether you're in a current. You can tell the kelp is bent over a bit here, um, so there's a current on this day. Um, and you know, oftentimes in the current in tropical waters too, you'll get the fish coming out, and and it makes it really fun, even if it is more work for you. So Garibaldi, the uh, California state fish. Um, of course, we're talking more about Oregon, but this is just a, such a fun highlight for, for diving down in California and really spectacular. You've got the light rays and they just really, really pop. When they're young, they've got these purple highlights on the fins that then they grow out of as they mature and become these bright orange, orange uh, damselfish. And of course, as we started talking about just the safety in the kelp forest, there is so, so much marine life that makes um, their home there, including um, abalone here we've got some uh blue rockfish so uh, a lot of just different species you know live in the kelp around the kelp on the kelp under the kelp under the kelp blades um you know even down to the hold fast here too and you can find nudibranchs on on and in around the 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 hold fast there's some brittle stars here that we can see um slug so there's there's so much going on the more we look um you know, as we're diving through it and again, up at the top, just lots of uh, lots of great fish life and marine life. So for me, when I'm diving and looking for photo opportunities, I'm looking down, I'm looking up, I'm trying to figure out exactly, um, you know, where how can I, I show just the breadth of life in the kelp forest by by making sure I keep my eyes open and camera ready even when ascending and descending, you know, to start and to end, to end the dive. And some of the fun subjects. So um, you know, a, a harbor seal here too. And these are really fun. This shot is actually from Southern California. Um, and I've, I don't have the best seal luck, to be honest. Um, I, find, I, I find a lot of the shy seals and they'll, they'll stare and just look at me from afar, whether surfing or diving, and don't want to come up and interact all that much. Um, on this particular dive, I was out free diving for probably about an hour. And the seal was taking an interest, starting to get real close, swim under me and things. So I figured, huh, let me go um, grab the camera. Let me grab a tank and go in the water. And I went in there and um, you know, seals, kind of like sea lions, um, are, are very interested and very curious animals. And, and sea lions are more, more like dogs, harbor seals in a way, but a lot more shy. Um, but they're just yeah, shy and playful. So what I started doing and a good way to, to get some of these, these um, animals to interact, especially harbor seals, is look very, very interesting. And for them, interesting means probably finding good food or, or something like that. So I'll go down to the bottom and grab kelp leaves and, and hold them up and try and sway them and poke my head into little holes and get really excited and, and sing and, and all of that. And that just intrigues them they're fascinated because they don't know what the heck is going on so the seals will will come up and start engaging and pretty soon you feel like a little weird thing on your fin and they're biting and then look around and boom off they dart and after a long time i think i spent you know at least 45 minutes before the seal finally approached after the first hour of free diving and then we finally started interacting shooting photos and we just had a great time for like another 45 minutes tank ran out i went back to the car switched tanks came back into the water and the harbor seal was shy again so you never know, but just these these encounters are so much fun. Um, and when you're shooting photos, trying to engage with uh, with marine life like that, it um it can help enhance the opportunities. And just the the wilderness within the kelp forest. Um, this is something that that just attracts me a lot. It's just uh, such a beautiful place and a wild place. So you know, trying to capture those feelings of of the kelp forest being a wild place to go and explore and spend time is um you know something that I try. <clears throat> that I strive to do in, in my photography. 
Okay, and moving north, finally, or not finally, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so the, the Nereocystis, the bull kelp, and um, some of the other species of kelp um, that live further north. Just spectacular, um, a totally different type of kelp. If you're looking from the coast, um, a lot of the kelp, kelp beds and kelp patties might blend in together. It'll be harder to see the difference between them, but oftentimes you'll be able to recognize bull kelp because some of these, these balls will, um, raise above the surface like this. So you can start to tell which kelp forests are which because you'll see like, you know, little mounds like this poking out from the surface. And that's really a good indicator that you've got some bull kelp there. Um, unless of course, like in Monterey where you've got more of a transition zone and um, you'll, you'll start to have bull kelp growing within the macrocystis, which can throw that, that looking at it um, tip off. But, uh, but generally these will, will grow to the surface and um, bend over and even create a kelp canopy like the macrocystis. Um, so here we go, they're, they're growing, they're just under the surface here, kind of showing what they do. And it's a different kelp forest. So you saw with the macrocystis, um, we had a lot more leafy kelp structure. It was like um, diving through vivid green plants and there's a lot more, um, I don't want to say a lot more going on, but just more density of, of kelp and density of the algae, right? So the bull kelp's a lot more stringy and it just goes up to the surface, um, but you've still got the same habitat for life in there. You've still got a lot of those same properties, a lot of fish, a lot of invertebrates, a lot of macro life, all calling the, uh, the bull kelp forest their, their home. Some examples here too. So on the right, we've got um, you know, one of the, uh, yeah, I want to say a floaty, but <laughs> so basically just a lot of pelagic drifters that will come in and out. And certain times you'll notice that as uh, green nutrient rich water will come in, sometimes you'll get a lot of these, these different floaties, um, a lot of jellyfish or things like that too. So oftentimes that can indicate just changes in the water or upwelling that brings these deep water creatures into the shallower water that will be diving. So there, there certainly are some indicators there that can help, um, yeah, help figure out what, what's going on with the water and even help you predict visibility over in the next couple of days and stuff like that too, because little things like having an upwelling event, which might bring nice, clear, but also very cold water, it's nutrient rich. But then if you have that with cloudy conditions, maybe the visibility will hang on for a little bit. But if you have that upwelling that brings some of these floaters in and it's very cold and clear water and it's nice sunny day, you might get an algae bloom a couple of days later and then that'll drop visibility down. So by keeping an eye on these things and trying to document these things, you can start to get a feel for what uh, potential dive conditions will be like. So I'm constantly looking for these and trying to draw parallels and associations with visibility. Um, a lot of times they just prove themselves wrong, but you got to keep trying to, to figure out and find, you know, what, what systems work for figuring out what's going on with the ocean, right? Um, and spending time is the best way. So just more examples of, of this bull kelp forest um, reef scapes, you know, we've got usual suspects, lots of starfish. Um, yeah, the uh, lots of other fish growing through and it can be different densities. Um, I believe this is off of Monterey right here. So off of the, the granite wall outside of Point Lobos, which you can can access from Monastery Beach or from Point Lobos. And then you've got a great bull kelp forest out here. Um, and start to look at these, these little holdfasts. So with the macrocystis kelp, we'll have giant holdfasts, a lot of these root systems that hold onto the rock or reef structure. With the bull kelp, it's a lot smaller. So they're, they're holding on tight. They still take that same abuse from the surge and the swell um, and just the, the, those ocean waves, but um, much smaller holdfasts that are holding on tight you know, or, or just as strong. And then as we start to explore these dive sites, I mentioned before some of the tips for, for finding some of these dive sites. Um, once we get to the top of the pinnacles, we might find different types of kelp. Um, you know, we can have uh, different palm kelps and stuff like that too. Um, and then a lot of the usual suspects, so sea stars and, and a lot of that small macro life. Um, one of the things with diving up north is that uh, at the top of some of these pinnacles and some of the sea structure, it's gonna be a lot rougher. So, so basically you have to choose the really calm days for, for me as a photographer, for going and diving those areas and coming up to the top where a lot of that surge is going to be to shoot these photos. You know, generally on a rougher day, you can go deeper and get under a lot of that surge from the swell or the, the wind swell, whatever that might be, you know, the, the longer period ground swell or the shorter period wind swell. Um, but yeah, it just needs to be very calm regardless to, to get up here and shoot some of these photos and kind of tell some of these stories at the top of the pinnacles. 
So as we get to some more of the marine life that lives in the kelp forest, um, this is actually a Puget Sound king crab, which was fun to see. This was in Mendocino um, and Puget Sound. You can probably guess where it got its name up there in Northwest Washington. Um, so it's fun to see the species, you know, towards the lower end of their range. And when you see stuff like that, you know, as a photographer, I'm always trying to document it. So shot some videos, shot some photos, just because it was, to me, a unique sighting. Um, after that, was able to find a bunch more and figure out kind of where they, where they're living um, up there in Mendocino and, um, and shoot some more photos. But when you first find the subject, it's really fun. Do the research. And for me, that's the prompt to break out the uh, Marine Life ID books and do some research and try and educate myself a little bit on the subject. So here's a, a classic scene here too. Um, no kelp here, but a lot of these Metridium anemones. And um, just, you know, you'll, you'll find that a lot of these places too, um, the behavior of a lot of the fish changes. Um, so with the blue rockfish, they're, they're always going to be schooling. They love the kelp. They're pretty friendly. They hang out. Um, but oftentimes with the kelp too, they'll end up following you around on the dive. So in, in Southern California, for instance, you've got certain species that will follow you around during a dive. But up here, you'll have this whole school of fish follow you around on a dive. So as a photographer, I love that because if I shoot up at the right angle as these fish are schooling sort of around me, I can sit there and try and work them into the frame. So it's really cool. Um, if you're not looking up, you might not even notice or see that they're actually following you. Um, they'll tend to hang out off the points and, and on those rocks there where a lot of fishermen go. Hint, hint, if there's fishermen there, you probably know that the fishermen know something you don't at a new dive site so that might be a fishy little area um so we'll go there and then it's just fun to have these these fish follow you around it's one of those just fun experiences um and then of course floating around again pacific sea nettle so these are really fun to shoot um, they'll come in in large groups we mentioned before it could be due to upwelling or any number of other ocean conditions or currents but when these events happen as a photographer, I try and jump on it and spend a, a portion of the dive here in midwater or just below the surface trying to shoot these, um, these jellies. You know, you want to diversify that photo portfolio. So I try and do that and tell a story through them. And then we also mentioned in terms of looking at the dive sites, some of these channels and crevices that take a lot of this wave energy and the surge energy, swell energy, because um, the invertebrates and a lot of this life really feeds off of, well, literally feeds off of it, but you know, they feed off of the energy. They love it there in those conditions because they can feed off of it. Um, so, so these are good places on very calm days to start looking for, for marine life. So you seek out those areas. Um, and then you can find these little pockets that are just really dense and filled with marine life, even if the area around it is a little bit more barren and there's not much going on, maybe it's a lot of open rock structure. Um, but you, you find these nooks and crannies and they can be really dense with, with life. So I'm constantly looking for that. Um, on the right here, we've got a, a China rockfish, which is cool. And over here on the left, we've got a, a good little stash of, uh, of abalone along with some uh, green sea anemones. And one of the interesting things with the, the sea anemones, if you haven't seen it, um, is that they, um, they're generally green, but if you find them in a cave where they're not doing any photosynthesis, they will turn white. So basically, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's super fun to find them, but they just don't get that color from the sun and they're, they're just white. And if you find them where they get partial sun or reflected light, they'll have a tint of green. But if you find them like deep back in a cavern or, or in a cave somewhere like that, they'll be completely white, which is just really eerie and weird if you're used to seeing the green anemones. So that's a lot of fun. And here, just another example of not knowing what you'll see on the wild coast. Um, we've got some giant fish eating anemones and they, um, they found the salp. I did not feed this um, to them. This must have been some long, long salp and they all managed to get a piece and everyone's having some lunch or some dinner and they're just hanging out eating it. So it's just kind of spectacular that again, this, this drifting event happened. You've got this huge salp chain coming in from wherever it came in and all three of these, um, these anemones managed to get a piece and, and feed. So stuff like that's just really cool. Not your traditional photo. Um, it's not Nemo swimming in a sea anemone, but it's something different that we have, you know, in the Northern California Pacific Northwest. And then wanted to, of course, touch on some photos from the changing ecosystem and kind of show some of the differences there and comparisons and contrasts with um, with years past and then with with the current conditions out there, um, you know, an effort to, to showcase the work, you know, so many great organizations are doing. So, 
you know, looking at this, the, the urchins are certainly one of the big problems. I'm sure a lot of us know, know far more than me uh, about the problem and the science behind it. But, you know, certainly the, the urchins are, are out there eating a lot of the kelp. Um, so here they are attacking one of those tiny little holdfasts from the bull kelp. Um, you know, they've managed to zero in on it and they're just going to town. Um, or here we're, we're starting to move in on some, some newer kelp growth got a, an army of urchins moving in. It's just what they do. They're very good at what they do. And then pretty soon you'll have the urchin barren. So it's, it's um, you know, a, a, a lot of the, the coast does have these urchin barrens now. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, certainly an issue, but, um, you know, just some photos to really showcase it. Um, an abalone here in a, in an urchin barren. So, you know, it's, it's out there looking for food. We've got all these urchins hanging around. Um, green, 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 and uh, purple. So on the left, a little bit of a contrast. We've got, um, this photo is from maybe 2013 or 2014. I used to do an annual pilgrimage from Southern California up to Mendocino, and we'd camp and free dive and scuba dive. So this is a photo, um, you know, showing just some of the density of abalone you'd find on just a typical rock. Whereas on the right, this is um, much less density um, with a lot of urchins that have moved in. So kind of a, a compare and contrast um, situation. You know, on the right is still healthy in the sense we've got, you know, a lot going on, big nudibranch. We've still got, um, you know, starfish and things like that too. But just that volume of urchins is, is pretty relentless. And just some more shots of the, uh, the urchins feeding. Um, so they'll take down the bull kelp, whether it's, it's come off by itself and it generally the, the kelp that's, that's detached will, I mean, it can float into shore or away, but it'll float down to the bottom of structure kind of in these channels, like we saw here. And it will lay oftentimes at the edge of like cliffs and big rock structure. And that's where a lot of these, um, these animals will go to, to find the kelp and eat the kelp because it's fallen down. So, um, you know, you, you've got that, but then you can also have, um, the urchins eating that base like we saw, and they can climb up the stalks and eat the kelp that way too. But um, when it does come down, it's, it's a heyday and everyone's feasting. And then they just can't get enough. So anything that comes within range, I'm starting to notice, you know, everyone is eating and going to town and trying to have a feast. So um, jellyfish are a favorite for, for a lot of different animals actually, but here's a bunch of urchins that managed to catch hold of one. So, and basically, you know, don't want to dwell on that sort of thing, um, but basically, you know, every effort does make a difference. Um, so that's what we're, we're here to do. And that's why we're listening. And it's exciting to have, you know, so much good interest. This is a kelp forest wild place. You know, we want to bring these kelp forests back. They are resilient. We've had some colder water this year, which is really good. Um, you know, at least down California, central Northern California, which is great. Um, yeah, and uh, one step at a time. So happy to answer photo questions. Hopefully I covered enough about the photography and stuff, but yeah, let's get in there and, and do that. Awesome. All right, I have several questions. Um, a couple from Instagram, one I asked yesterday and one okay. from Aaron right now. Um, he asked, or she, sorry, I guess it could be both. Um, what's your take on my octopus teacher? Diving methods in the film, generally wetsuit list, tracking abilities underwater and so forth. Yeah, you know, that is, is interesting. It was certainly, um, uh, and this is just obviously my personal opinion, but, you know, a moving film and it was, you know, I think written to, to be a moving film, um, but it, it really fascinating in the sense they were able to share, um, you know, share the story of the octopus and what it goes through and what it does and just capture some of that incredible footage, you know, when it did have the fight with the shark and all of that. Um, I guess I don't want to talk too much <laughs> or spoiler alerts, but, um, you know, I, I think that anything um, like that that's raising awareness um, is a good thing. Um, you know, to, to a point, don't, that's not a blanket statement, <laughs> but, you know, in, in terms of the, the cold water swimming, you know, there's a lot of uh, great science behind that in terms of ice baths um, for both athletes, as well as just to, to, you know, enhance your health. Um, and I have friends who do that in Northern California and stuff too, um, who'll go to those cold swims. So I believe in the film, he did say he goes and swims for what, like 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. So there is a limit if the water's really cool. 
Um, so in terms of that no wetsuit, you know, no issue there. Um, the hood I thought was a great idea. Um, I always dive with a hood locally when it's when it's cold. Even in the tropics, I dive with a hood, and most of the time I dive with earplugs too. Um, on a personal note, I think that the more you fuss with your ears, the more likely you're you are to get ear infections and things like that. So you see everyone um, going upside down and getting water in their ears and putting you know drips in and then this drip and then that drip and then doing all these things and you know the, have these problems. But you know with earplugs and a hood, I keep the bubbles out, I keep the water out, and the, the ears tend to do good. So I saw the hood, I was like, yeah, someone else like me who would wear a hood with nothing else. <laughs> Um, you know, in terms of the, the free diving technique and stuff, um, you know, I, I saw one of those that looked like a nice, um, quiet entry into the water, right? When you're free diving, you want to be completely stealth regardless of what you're doing. Um, but especially for photography, if you can disturb the marine life as, as little as possible, that's good. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. It looked like there was a, a lot of handheld camera work, a lot of setting the camera down, and then also a third party holding the camera too. So just a mixture of camera angles. Hope that answered that. I hope so too. Yeah. Um, oh, the, the, actually, the, the one other thing I wanted to emphasize there, um, just because we're on it, but spending time in the water does give you those insights. Um, you have been fortunate to spend a lot of time in, in our kelp forest and then a lot of time um, in the Philippines diving um, all in over the years, you know, months and months in the Philippines. And you start to see little things like the two week egg cycles and what the tide does and what the new moon does versus the full moon and where the creatures live and when they come out to, to mate and, and do all these things. So by spending the time in the water, you start to gain those insights into the marine life. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. So, you know, I think that's important. And for me, you know, looking at it from that perspective, every day does help you learn a dive site. You know, some of those things like tracking, um, you know, I, tracking an octopus might be hard aside from the remnants of its food, right? So you can see the pieces of shell and kind of where they go, but you know, it's really, it's fairly easy to spot an octopus den that's been lived at because you find those shells outside of a hole in the reef. You poke your head inside if someone's home, that's their, their home. So there are indicators like that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, somebody via Instagram asked, why do so many underwater photographers use a GoPro attached to their main camera? I think that is to quickly shoot video. Um, so if you're set up for, for shooting photos, but you want to also capture video really easily, um, you, can, you can just press that GoPro, turn it on, and start recording. Um, the time it is not useful is if you're recording video while you're shooting still photos, because when you're shooting still photos, you're moving around and you're jerky and you're popping your flashes, and that does not make for good video. So the people doing it correctly are the ones who will turn the GoPro on and use that as their primary camera and stay very steady, like they would, like they're they're consciously filming video. So in that in that sense, it's it's pretty useful. Um, I'll also take one on macro dives. So for instance, if I have my small macro lens looking for really tiny subjects the size of a tennis ball, I might stick a GoPro on my housing just to record the, the big wide angle scenes because inevitably something big and fun will, will come by. Or, you know, maybe it tells a story. You can see the wide angle of a diver moving into the macro subject and then show your video of this tiny little nudibranch that's that big. So, you know, sometimes that's a good use for it. Yeah, I like that perspective. Yeah. Um, another question, what's a good initial light setup for California? Yeah, so uh, initial light setup will really depend on the camera, and then it will depend on whether you're shooting photo or video. Um, so if you're shooting video, it's going to be a, a video light, so a constant light. And if that's the case, I'm a big fan of normally, like I said at the beginning, I think you can produce great photos with even a very basic camera system. But the when you're talking about video lights, more money equals more lumens and lumens is, is the brightness. So the more you can spend on those, it's sort of the better off you'll be because um, those lights do last a long time. And the brighter those lights, the, the better you can light subjects, especially as you get farther away and the more vivid the colors you can produce. Um, for photography, generally, if you're shooting macro, one strobe is fine to start out. If you want to shoot big wide angle scenes and, and reef scapes or larger animals like that, then you probably want two strobes, which is useful because it just gives you a wider coverage um, and helps you position those strobes to, to 
put that light on the subject, and then also minimize backscatter and some of the particulate in the water. So in California, of course, that's a bigger concern because we do have that particulate, especially um, you know, this time of year. So you wanna avoid that and two strobes will help with that. Um, depending on your interest in photography, you can go and, and pay a little more for strobes with manual um, controls, which I highly recommend because you can keep them and grow into them and start using manual strobe power. But if, you know, small, easy, and the cheapest option is, is you know, your MO, or you just want to test the hobby, then an automatic strobe that does not have manual power is the way to go just because it's a little more affordable. So hopefully that helps. Great. Well, that's, all the questions that I see, does anybody have any last minute dying questions to ask? You can type it in the Q&A or the chat works too. That was some wonderful information. I learned so much. As a Excellent. Sure, underwater photographer. Yeah, a little insight into the uh, into the kelp forest. So, yeah, you know, if anyone does has questions, feel free to follow up and um, yeah, follow on social media. I'm on all the social medias. Um, but yeah, thank you again for having me, Chanel. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, and um, stay tuned for our next webinar, which will be on abalone on the 25th. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.